Okay, so we are back on the channel, in the studio. Uh, I want to thank everyone that came by the Prime Card 24-hour live stream. It ended up being 28 hours uh, that we were live, but it was uh, amazing. Shout out to everybody that was involved, my team, some of the guests that we had on, Le'Veon, True Jordy, Rock Jr., um, everyone that came by and supported. It was one of the most fun things I've done, one of the most challenging things I've done as a content creator, but... We got through it, and uh, you guys showed love, so thank you for that. Um, thank you for showing love at TheBreakdownShop.com. That's still live. If you want to go and cop some of that Breakdown merch, it's over there. But today, you guys knew I had to cover the controversy that has become KSI versus Tommy Fury. Because in an event full of pre-fight hype and wondering what would happen when these two collided, it was the fight I was most excited to see, but the fight that also left me the most confused. And I kind of still feel that way, but we're going to break down all of it because it's finally time for the breakdown. Did KSI get robbed in the Tommy Fury fight? Did the judges get this one wrong? What actually happened with KSI and Tommy Fury? And where does everyone go from here? It's complicated yet simple, but... I'll explain. Breakdown. Let's go. All right, so going over this fight, we're going to take away the things coming into it that have nothing to do with the fight itself because I think that making arguments based on the fact that one person was a pro and one person wasn't does in some ways sway the audience and sways your opinion on how the fight itself actually goes down. So while I agree that KSI had no business being even remotely competitive in this fight because of his lack of experience and Tommy's years of experience, Tommy being the pro, KSI being the YouTuber, to use those as an argument base for who won this fight is irrelevant. You can't do it because it has no bearing on the actual fight itself. Sure, these are qualifiers for why the fight shouldn't have been competitive, but having those things in mind while judging how this fight went doesn't do anybody any justice. It definitely doesn't do KSI justice because then you're giving him concession pats on the back. Like, hey, you know, you did good for where you were. And I don't think that he wants that. And I don't want to do that to him. I want to judge him for exactly what it was in the fight he brought, which in my opinion was a lot more than I expected. Round one was a swift reminder that unorthodox technique and commitment to a game plan is exactly what makes KSI competitive in fights like this, where again, Forethought says he shouldn't be, but he finds a way to be. People are going to get upset when I say this, but that I don't mean it in the way it sounds. KSI fights in negatives, if that makes sense. He is trying to take away what you do best, which is a negating factor in the fight itself, and it allows him to be more successful, which I know that sounds like I'm being negative myself, but what that really means is he negates one of your biggest strengths. He negated Tommy Fury's jab with what he was able to do with his bladed stance, with his bouncing in and out, with his feints, and with his blitz. There was a lot of things that going into this fight I thought would give JJ trouble, and Tommy just wasn't able to do it because KSI fought in the negatives. He negated the biggest weapon, which through the chain of events of what came after the jab, negated a lot of Tommy's offense. You saw this, like I said, in round one with JJ being completely bladed, fully accepting the Michael Venom Page bladed stance and again, the lead shoulder and the hands bopping back out and forth. Everything just rhythm at that point. It's all rhythm fighting. There is really no forethought to traditional boxing. It's almost completely point style karate movements. And we'll talk with Faye Sensei later on the breakdown about that, but that's what it looked like. It looked like someone that had been training exclusively to do this for six rounds. There was no thought into changing. This was going to be what you got from JJ for good or for bad. You saw a big right hand that I swear watching live on the TV you could see the audience damn near lose their mind like the roof almost came off the place when JJ landed a big jumping in right hand and Tommy felt it, right? He took a couple of those steps back and understood from that point on that this was, again, maybe going to be a little more difficult than he and I thought it would be to land his offense and get going with that kind of threat of the right hand. That's what JJ said, right? He said his right hand would make the difference. And once Tommy felt it, the fight would change. And that's what happened. The rest of the round was a foreshadowing of what we were going to get in this fight. A lot of commitment from JJ to that right hand and to his feints to set the right hand up. And again, talking about those feints, I thought he used his timing very well. I thought that there were moments where he was trying to bait reactions out of Tommy to then double up the same bouncing feint forward, right? He would step in, give that feint, step, step, give the feint, and then go. While Tommy is still trying to gather what's happening in front of him, reset, try to get to his jab, but being caught in between the space and being not as committal as he would have been had he not felt the right hand before that. So JJ was giving himself openings while also stifling Tommy's defense, also stifling Tommy's jab, which again, is his biggest weapon. Without the jab, 
Tommy really has no offense to go off of because he's trained as a traditional boxer and everything comes off that lead hand. Also, round one is where we get a lot of the uh, the clinching because again, yes, one of the big strengths of JJ is again, like I've said before, one of the big weaknesses. If he doesn't land the big right hand, he will fall into the clinch. And you can look at that in a couple different ways. You could say, okay, that ability to fall in behind the right hand keeps him safe. And it absolutely does, but it also stifles any opportunity for him to throw follow-up punches. Maybe that's not the goal. And in fact, listening to his coaches in the corner round by round, I don't think it was the goal. I think the goal was simply be able to blade our stance, faint, bounce in and out, be able to get reactions out of Tommy to land the right hand. If the right hand doesn't land, we clinch, we reset, we go again. Pretty simple game plan. The weakness of it is that you solely rely on landing that right hand. And if that doesn't land cleanly multiple times over, there are gaps and opportunities for a guy like Tommy to take back the fight in certain instances just with his jab or just with forward movement because of just the clinch heavy nature and the lack of volume or any sort of consistent offense from either guy. And again, sticking with the first round, we see JJ have some success in the clinch. And this is a subject of controversy for a lot of people like, oh, JJ wins the clinch exchanges. Tommy is not clinching as much. JJ's clinching too much. There was a lot of that back and forth. And even you have to talk about the shots behind the head that Tommy landed, but also I will say JJ lands some as well in this fight. And, and again, it's the nature of exchanging in the clinch, which is why it's called dirty boxing. These shots are a very gray area as far as scoring them because of the subjective nature of boxing judging. If you like dirty boxing, even though these aren't necessarily legal shots, then you're going to reward that. Like I said, the shots behind the head, the reason these shots were landing, and I'm not saying they were intentional from Tommy, and I'm not saying they're intentional from JJ, but in my opinion, when I look at them, these two guys are fighting in the clinch, right? And both guys' heads being on the opposite shoulder of their power hand means that when they go to duck a shot in the clinch and bury their head on the opposite side, when the overhand comes around, there's only one place for it to go. So when both guys are going to the body and then trying to go upstairs, go to the body, go upstairs, actually you're either gonna find yourself landing behind the ear or if that head turns, behind the head. Both guys do it multiple times throughout the fight. I will say it looked like Tommy did do it more in the totality of the fight, but JJ also had his fair share. The difference was, and I think this was a smart play from JJ. Again, it's a fight at the end of the day and being able to call attention to things that are illegal so that the referee finds his eyes to those things more is a smart move. Whether you want to call it complaining or whatever, I thought it was a smart move. JJ starts to already rub the back of his head and we've seen JJ's prior opponents do the same things, but in this case, it was a smart move because in the clinch, it brought the referee's eyes to Tommy hitting behind the head and not necessarily JJ doing it. So JJ shows the referee, he's hit me behind the head, he's hitting me behind the head. The referee takes a warning to Tommy, I think even a couple of times, maybe in the first and second. But long story short, the first round goes to JJ. I thought he did enough with that big right hand to open the fight up and Tommy didn't get his jab established in that round. I think that one pretty simply goes to JJ. Round two is a source of massive controversy because this could be the deciding round in the fight. You give JJ a 10-8 here and Tommy doesn't win the rest of the rounds, then JJ wins the fight. If you give Tommy the 9-9 here and JJ wins only one more round, he loses this fight. So there's a little bit of back and forth here where it really depends on who you scored this round to because there is the point being taken away in round two. This, this was a massive deal for the fight. And it's hard because I'm sitting here watching and both guys are kind of doing it back and forth. Again, Tommy is doing it more, but Tommy's been the only one warned for it. So I guess you can't really argue the point being taken when he's warned multiple times for it. So whether I agree with it or not, doesn't really matter. The point gets taken here and the rest of the round is so fucking difficult to judge because again, you're finding very small pockets of did he land, did he not? Or in the clinch, do we score volume there or damage there when both guys are landing to the body and both guys are wearing it. No one's getting hurt there. And as we separate, we really get no chance for any offense to get going because if JJ doesn't land his right hand, it flies over the top of Tommy. There's a clinch and rinse and repeat. And same with Tommy, if his jab doesn't land and he overreaches on his stuff and doesn't land his right hand, then we also clinch. This round's a tough one for me because JJ, again, I think in this round has the bigger moment. If, I'm not, if I remember correctly, he lands a right hand in this round as well. And Tommy doesn't have a very big moment here, but he does have front foot forward pressure. He does have a couple of jabs that land here. Um, this is the problem with scoring fights with such little output is that, again, you leave this up to subjectivity, and when that's the case, you're going to get wildly different scores. For the sake of what I think this fight ends up being, in my opinion, I think JJ wins this round, giving him three rounds up on Tommy after the second round. Rounds three and four go to Tommy Fury, in my opinion. I think this is when he starts to establish his jab. And again, you bring in the 
gift and the curse of what JJ's style is, right? It is very explosive, it's very unorthodox, but it's also very one dimensional. And what I mean by that is once Tommy does start to establish his jab and interrupt the flow of what JJ wants to do with his bounce in and out, and there's again, almost all vertical movement from JJ. There really isn't a lot of side to side lateral movement with that bladed stance. It's kind of tough to do. So once that vertical movement is stopped or stifled and Tommy is able to get on his jab, that's where the problems for JJ are created. And that's where he has to almost exclusively go to the clinch to stop that forward momentum from Tommy and to reset the action. And this is where a lot of, if you're on the side of Tommy Fury, you've got a lot of complaints about JJ clinching a lot in this fight. And, and again, the referee was quick to separate them, but never no warnings given for the excessive clinching, if that's what you wanted to call it. Again, I don't have a ton of problems with that because there was some work being done in those clinches, just again, where that subjectivity comes into play. So if again, you were looking for more of the traditional boxing and referee separating and, and warning for those clinches, then yeah, that's going to frustrate you. But if you're looking at a fight, a scrap, which is what this was and what KSI makes pretty much all of his fights, this was kind of par for the course for what you've seen from KSI. There's a lot of clinching in his fights. It reminded me a lot of the Logan 2 fight, but it more so reminded me of Jake Paul versus Tyron Woodley 2, where two guys were just headbutting continuously, not physically headbutting, but running into each other and running into range continuously because, again, it was a style clash a bit. And that word clash makes a lot of sense because that's all Tommy and JJ did when both were trying to get their offense. And this is why I said JJ was fighting negatives because it's not a knock on JJ that this thing became a clunkier fight. This is what his game plan was. This is what he wanted to do. This is what you hear his coaches in his corner telling him to do. Find your way to the clinch. If the right hand isn't there, we'll reset and get back to it. When you look at those two things, JJ got to do what he wanted to do more in this fight than Tommy Fury did, which is why I say... When JJ is negating what Tommy's doing, it's a good thing for him, regardless if it may not be the prettiest thing for everyone to see. Regardless if you like that or not, if the referee isn't going to warn him about it, if the referee's not going to say, hey, stop that clinching or come in and separate sooner, you can't really do anything other than continue doing what's working for you. Doesn't make for the prettiest fight? No, it doesn't. But if you're JJ or if you're that camp, do you really give a shit if it's pretty or not? You're trying to win a fight, just like we talked about with Anthony Taylor. People call him boring or, you know, whatever you want to call him. He's trying to win a fight. Whether the style is something you like or not isn't really anything of his concern. He's trying to win just like Tommy is. And while JJ was doing things to negate Tommy, Tommy also made some really big mistakes in this fight. Like, again, when Tommy did find his jab in the third and fourth round and the opportunities were there for him to walk forward and really land big shots his right hand once again was so overcrowded by him closing distance and not managing that distance the way he should which we've been saying on this channel for years he crowds his right hand to the point where he can't throw it over the top and if anybody just steps in and gives him a shoulder bump or looks to clinch, crowds himself to the point where he has to short arm an outside body shot and not be able to come over the top with his right hand, you'd think for a guy that's been fighting for as long as he has, these things would be corrected. But fight after fight, including the Jake fight till now, we've seen the same Tommy Fury. The same mistakes are made. Even when JJ catches him with a big right hand, I don't know if it was round two or the round we're about to talk about in five, where Tommy looks to the uppercut coming forward, which again baffles me as a, as a combination choice. You're ja double jabbing, uppercut, stepping into JJ throwing a right hand versus off the back foot, sliding out of the way of the right hand to throw the uppercut. Tommy leaves his chin in the fucking air for JJ to come right across it with the big right hand. Luckily in this fight, KSI wasn't as accurate as he'd like to be, and that's one of the big points that we'll talk about with JJ as well, is his inaccuracy because of his full-on commitment and his tracking not being what it could be, should he be just a bit more patient or get a better understanding of fighting off the back foot. But if he was, Tommy was putting himself in bad positions by just walking in, hands down, jabbing low, chin high, and shot selections with his right hand that frankly made no sense. So there is an argument that the JJ negated a lot of what Tommy does well off his jab. But we also have to explain this quite simply. Tommy Fury is not as good as he thought he was. He's not as good as I thought he could be. And it's not because he doesn't have talent. It's not because he doesn't know the game or he doesn't know how to box it's because his lack of commitment to getting better is starting to show i'm sure he works very hard i think everybody in the scene does but his commitment to boxing should be resulting in better technique and a better understanding of shots taken versus shots delivered and the accuracy and timing of both offensive defense transition it's just not there guys that have been doing this for two to three to four to five years are catching up to him and quite frankly given two to three more years would run right past Tommy when it comes to the experience, technical ability, and just fight IQ. It's it's baffling. Then we get to round five, which is a very controversial round. And it's because, again, you're talking about super low output in this round. And quite frankly, it, 
one moment going either way for both guys can win them this round. I think again, JJ lands a big right hand in this round and there's a lot of clinch work where JJ's throwing pretty vigorously to the body and upstairs and Tommy's working his body shots in the clinch. And there's a lot of clinch and separate, clinch and separate, which again made this fight a bit of a, a, a tougher watch for, you know, what you'd call the normies or people that are watching this for the spectacle that we hyped it up to be. But this is where, in my opinion, the fight is, is won and lost. This is where you find out who wants to fight more, whether it's the most beautiful thing or not. You got to get a little gritty and... To be frank, both guys here were getting gritty. Both guys here were in this fight. It's just again, a round where we're scoring almost exclusively clinch. But JJ having a little more success in the clinch in this round, which again, you could argue was the case for a lot of the rounds. And again, the one we're about to score coming up. I just don't know how to pick a winner and loser of this round. So I'm going to go 10-10 here because the judging of this is so tough when there's a lack of offense between the two of them. I'm sure people are going to say, Wade, look, JJ landed this and landed that. And, and he did. He landed, again, off memory. There was the moment where, the only moment where I saw him fight off the back foot and time a shot from Tommy, slip underneath the jab, bang the uppercut. It just, it unfortunately didn't land but it was the idea that i liked much like the rest of the fight i liked a lot of the ideas jj had unfortunately most of them were cascaded by overshooting and inability to land cleanly tommy was on his jab again again he's, he's controlling a little bit of the front of the ring there and with a lack of much to judge i think they split this round they go 10 10 so round six comes and again we get more of the same here i thought tommy really tried to take the initiative on the front foot in this round i thought jj was doing his thing again trying to land that big right hand i think there's a moment where he lands one in this round again and i know that people will score this round based on that moment but i will score this round based on its totality and i do think that tommy fury wins round six to go away here i hate scoring things on ring generalship and just a jab but fuck's sake there wasn't much else to judge it on again the clinch work is great but these are shots that are again back and forth you're seeing jj land some and they're heavy shots for sure but you're also seeing tommy land some to the body as well he is landing some over the top they're hitting behind the ear and some behind the head jj's throwing some behind the head jj even complains i think in this round about getting hit behind the head again which again smart tactic it is what it is but i thought tommy on his jab which again wasn't super effective in fact tommy being inaccurate same with jj is the reason this fight is as close as it is and you guys aren't gonna like this but me scoring this round for tommy means that i think this fight was a draw jj wins three rounds tommy wins three rounds that's exactly what i see with round five being a push and i know that's the ultimate fence setting this fight was the definition of subjectivity and fence setting like there is multiple ways you could see it you could see a jj win you could see a tommy win i didn't feel like tommy won this fight but i had said this on twitter and i'll stand by it from the moment it happened and even on rewatch i didn't feel like jj lost this fight it's a draw to me straight up and down that's what it looks like i don't have any other way to, to split it than that i know that people aren't gonna like that people want to have that definitive answer but when a fight like this happens and nothing about it is super definitive you have to call a spade a spade, in my opinion, and that's what I'm doing here. And I saw a lot of people saying that JJ was being a sore loser, and maybe that's the case, that JJ was being a little sore about the loss that he didn't think was a loss. But in those moments, a fighter has every right to feel exactly how they want to feel, and it is JJ's first loss. Again, not that I felt it was. I thought it was a draw, but on paper, it's his first loss. So him going through that mindset and trying to just play that out in his head and having the emotions that all come with that, I didn't feel like it was very fair of the zone after he was asked the questions in the ring and they had their back and forth, make what you will about that. But when he got on the stage and they kept asking him about it, I didn't think that was very fair. And that's not a shot at anybody over there. It's just maybe a miss on the production side to try to get KSI's thoughts right there in that moment. Maybe give him a couple of days and see how he reacts then, but I didn't like that. And him kicking the thing, it just showed that he was not in the right mindset to be answering those kind of questions in that moment. Give him a couple days and it is what it is. Now, as far as what happens next, this is where things get interesting because I'm sure that JJ will want that rematch and I wouldn't be super opposed to it, but you have Tommy Fury going on interviews after the fight saying he's the king of influencer boxing and that this is his show now and he's the head of the table. First off, there's one head of the table and his name is fucking Roman Reigns. Throw your ones up and acknowledge your tribal chief. But two, Tommy Fury is the ultimate industry plant here. This is not Tommy Fury's game. And it's funny how the entire time the plan was to destroy influencer boxing before Tommy realized he may not be at a level higher than this. So now he's just going to take it over. There's a very simple way to prove that Tommy is not the head of the table. It's by JJ and the man that was ringside, the man that we all want to see, JJ fight, Jake Paul, deciding finally after five and a half years 
Let's get business done. Because if that's the case, Tommy Fury got no say in anything and he'll be removed from the scene swiftly. It's the fight we should make. It's the fight we've always wanted. And I don't understand at this point why it can't happen. But I do understand that JJ as a competitor may want the Tommy rematch. And me personally, I can say my opinion is don't do that. Because it may have diminishing returns if he doesn't win that fight. Not saying he won't because he proved everybody wrong in his plans to do this one. And again, whether you believe he won or not, he fared a lot better than he should have in this fight. But I just think that the more we indulge Tommy Fury's demands or requests as the top of the scene, like beating Tommy Fury establishes us as what? What does it establish KSI as at this point? What does it establish Jake as at this point? And again, they have their own missions. KSI wants that rematch. Jake has already said he wants that rematch, but the scene needs Jake and KSI. Whether it means this is the end or the apex, every story deserves that chapter closing. I don't know if it's the end of influencer boxing, but it definitely would be the end of this chapter. And this has been an amazing chapter for the last five years, but it needs its finality. It really does. And the more we delay it, the less chance we're going to get to turn that page on this chapter and fully move on from it. For years and years and years, wondering what could have been, it makes us the thing we hate about pro boxing, and that is that the biggest fights that we want to see either don't happen or they happen way past the prime of the two fighters when they should have, and it gives you that deflated feeling like, damn, why couldn't we have done this five years ago? I don't want that for Jake and KSI. Please, as a community, we have to push for this thing or else it may not ever happen. And just as I say that, this is what I'm talking about because my opinions on this, the community's opinions on this, don't dictate the will of the people in the scene doing it. And you have to respect them wanting to challenge themselves. And both Jake and KSI are on their own journeys. And as I say that, Jake has announced he's fighting on December 15th, which just so happens to be the day of most valuable prospects number four, which means in all likelihood that Jake won't be fighting JJ. And it doesn't mean that regardless what happens in this fight, we still can't do Jake and JJ, but it's just another stepping stone, another block, another hurdle between the fight we all want to see, but you have to realize that our goals for the scene aren't necessarily the ones of the fighters that dominate it. Jake says he wants to become a world champion. I don't think that's very likely, but it's not up to me and it's not up to you guys. We just hope and pray and continue to push for those two getting in the ring. So as this thing ends, KSI Tommy Fury, it was a fight that to be quite honest, left a lot to be desired. And a lot of people are saying, oh, it was a stinker of a fight. I don't know if I'll go that far. I just know that when you have an event of this magnitude, the hype beforehand is almost impossible to live up to. And this was a case, once again, of that hype not being able to be lived up to. I thought both guys had more that they could have shown in the ring, but just didn't. And there is an appeal going on, I guess. And I don't know, it may be out by the time this video comes out. So if I'm wrong about this, sorry i just i don't know how these things work especially with the pba and subjective nature of judging in the pba's judging <laughs> i don't think that this appeal that jj is putting in to reverse the decision or have a second look at the judging scorecards is going to do much here because as of the time of recording this was a majority decision for tommy fury and i guess there were some miscalculations on one of the scorecards of that became a unanimous decision for tommy fury meaning every single judge scored the fight 57 56 for tommy i think it would take a lot to sit down and reverse every single judge's decision to a draw and or a completely flipped decision for JJ. That doesn't mean you have to get every judge. Maybe this goes from a unanimous decision to a majority decision once again, or unanimous to a split. Either way, I just don't know that this is gonna get overturned. In fact, I don't think it will. And that's something that a lot of people aren't going to like, but I don't know what else to tell you other than subjectivity is going to be rampant in a fight that is so closely contested without a ton of action. This is not a robbery. This is simply a fight without a lot of action and a lot of subjectivity in the judging of what happened. Whether you favor clinch fighting, whether you favor ring control, whether you favor moments or volume, or these things are all subjective. And for the folks in the influencer boxing scene that haven't been around combat sports for very long, Welcome to the sport. As the great Max Holloway would say, it is what it is. So I have it as a draw. KSI didn't lose, and I know he doesn't like moral victories, and in his position, I wouldn't either, but this is a massive victory for influencer boxing. In my opinion, and I think the people watching at home, what happens next? These events tend to take time for everybody to kind of process and move on from, but... Jake's fighting December 15th, and this scene, as is the case for social media in general, is going to move on quickly. KSI and Jake is the fight, in my opinion, but does it ever happen? I don't have those answers. I guess we'll find out. <laughs>